All right, welcome everyone. Today is going to be chapter nine. We're going to talk about the joints. So this will finish up our unit on the skeletal system. So first we're going to talk about how we classify joints. So we classify them um, using structure and function. So all joints are going to have a structural classification and a functional classification. And then we're going to spend probably most of the time talking about synovial joints. Um, and synovial joints are kind of the ones that you think of um, that have a lot of movement and have joint fluid. Uh, so we'll go over how synovial joints move and how they allow us to um, move our bones and uh, using our muscles. And then at the end, we always kind of go over some joint disorders and a little bit about development. So we've seen the word articulations before, and so that's just where two rigid elements of the skeleton come together is called a joint. So you have two uh, long bones or two bones, period, the ends of bones coming together and where they come together is called an articulation or a joint. And anything that you see with arthro in it also means joint. So arthroscopy means to put a camera into a joint. So a lot of medical terms use the word arthro. So whenever you see that, that's referring to a joint. And so why do we have joints? What's the importance of the structure of the joints? Well, if you think about it, you're having two strong, rigid uh, structures coming together. And so the joint has to be able to resist crushing, tearing, and other forces because they're gonna be moving. So most joints we'll be talking about are gonna have some sort of movement. And so that movement is happening between two bones and you don't want bone on bone movement. And that's where the joint comes into play. So you're going to have cartilage in between the bones. You're going to have synovial fluid between the bones. You're going to have ligaments and stability for that joint. So that's what we're going to be talking about. So let's get into those classifications of joints. So we said all joints are going to have a functional classification and a structural classification. So let's talk about functional first. So what, when, what do we mean when we say a functional classification? Well, you're gonna ask yourself how much movement is in that joint, okay? So we know that those synovial joints have a lot of movement, kind of what you think of as a joint in the body has a lot of movement, but there are joints in the body that don't have a lot of movement or no movement at all. So our first type are, is synarthrosis, and that is an immovable joint. And this is common in the axial skeleton. So think of all those skull bones, right? So there are joints in between all of those skull bones, but they don't move, right? So they came together and they formed a synarthrotic joint, okay? So we'll go through those. And then our next type is called amphiarthrosis and that is slightly movable. So again, it's fairly common in the axial skeleton. Um, that's gonna be something like our pubic symphysis, okay? So the pubic symphysis is in the pelvis, right? So we said it has that fibrocartilage in there and it does allow for some movement if you kind of think about childbirth, right? So it does allow for a little wiggle room um, within that uh, pelvic cavity. Okay. But our most common one that we think of is diarthrosis, and that's freely movable. So all synovial joints that we'll talk about are considered diarthrotic joints. So it's very common in the appendicular skeleton. So our appendages and the limbs, right? We have lots of synovial joints in our limbs, right? Because our limbs are so mobile. So now if we talk about structural classification, this is based on what type of material is gonna bind that joint together, okay? And you're also gonna ask yourself, is there a joint cavity within that joint? So not all joints have a joint cavity. 
we did talk about uh, synovial joints as having a joint cavity, okay? But otherwise, a lot of them don't, okay? So what are our three types of structural classifications? Our first is fibrous, okay? So fibrous, you can kind of think, okay, maybe the material that binds the bones together is fibrous material, okay? And then another type, the cartilaginous, Okay, oh, well, maybe cartilage joins the bones together. Okay, so we can kind of make sense there. And then synovial joints have synovial fluid in between the bones, okay, and a joint capsule. So we'll talk about these three individually as well. And I just have this picture over here on the right that shows you kind of where in the limb or the body you might find these types of joints and we'll go through them as well but you notice most of them um, are synovial right so we're in a limb so most of them are going to be synovial joints but you do see here oh there's a fibrous joint um, in the ankle and there's a cartilaginous joint at that pubic symphysis okay So just like I said in the beginning, and something to keep track of as well, is when you're talking about any specific joint, they're going to have a functional and structural classification. So it's not one or the other. Each joint has both, right? Because it's going to have an amount of movement, and it's going to have material that binds it together. Okay, so you have both functional and structural. So now let's go through uh, those individual structural classifications. So first we're going to talk about fibrous joints. So these guys, just like we said their name helps us out, is they are connected by fibrous connective tissue. So they do not have a joint cavity, so it's just bone with bone connected with fibrous connective tissue. So these guys, if we're talking about um, the functional classification they're going to be in, they're going to be either immovable or slightly movable. So these guys will fall in the synarthrosis or amphiarthrosis category. So it just depends on which one we're talking about. So we have three fibrous joints or types of fibrous joints. Uh, our first one is a suture. So we saw the sutures in the skull, right? So the, the skull bones come together and create sutures. So they are connected with dense fibrous connective tissue, okay? So no movement, right? We said there's no movement in the sutures between those skull bones. Um, and then our next type is called syndesmoses. And again, you're going to be like, oh my God, there's so many syn, S-Y-N words and S words. I highly recommend making flashcards for all of these. Okay. So the syndesmosis is held, to held together by a ligament. Okay. So it's fibrous uh, connective tissue, but it is a little bit longer. The fibers are a little bit longer in length. Okay. So this example is going to be um, the joint in between the fibula and the tibia. Okay, so there's an actual ligament there that joins the two bones together. Okay, so again, very slight movement in these. Um, the longer the ligament, the more uh, movement you have. Okay, and the last one is a gum fossus. So gum fossus, I think, really helps us out because it sounds like the gums in your mouth. And this is the joint um, where your teeth are in your uh, sockets, right? So in the maxilla and the mandible, we talked about those alveolar processes that hold your teeth. Well, there's going to be a periodontal ligament. Okay, so it's a small little ligament of fibrous connective tissue that holds your tooth in the tooth socket okay, of the bone. So these guys also uh, don't have a lot of movement, right? It's a very short ligament and your teeth shouldn't move in, your, uh, in the bone, right? So not a lot of movement there. <laughs> 
So let's go through these individually just to kind of give us a better idea, right? So suture joints are um, only found in the skull, right? So they ossify kind of in middle age, actually. So really you only get that fibrous connective tissue early on um, in growth and childhood, and then they do eventually ossify, okay? So it turns to bone essentially. So they're only a true joint for, you know, maybe half your life, which is kind of interesting, right? But very minimal connective tissue between the bones, no movement, right? So those are suture joints. Syndesmosis joints, okay, are connected by ligaments. And again, the amount of movement depends on the length. So we have um, that the joint in between the fibula and the tibia, and that's called the tibiofibular joint. So you just put those two words together and it gives you a joint. And these guys are immovable, okay? So not a lot of movement there. It's a fairly short ligament, okay? So you shouldn't really have movement. It's supposed to be helping to stabilize the ankle joint. Okay, so yes, the ligament is a little bit longer, obviously, than a suture, but you still shouldn't have a lot of movement. Whereas the interosseous membrane, if you remember, is the um, ligament between both the tibia and the fibula and your radius and ulna in your arm. And there actually is a lot of movement there. So they are considered diarthrotic joints because they do have free movement. But again, that's a very, very long ligament between those two bones. So again, that movement depends on the length of the ligament. And last but not least, we have that gum fosis, which is really easy to remember because of the gum part. It sounds like your gums and your teeth. So these guys are holding the tooth root to the bone, and that's that periodontal ligament, right? So now let's go through the cartilaginous joints. So these guys are united by cartilage. So whereas we had our fibrous joints, which are connected with um, fibrous connective tissue, now we have cartilage, right? So cartilage is still a connective tissue, but it's different than our fiber connective, fibrous connective tissue. We still don't have a joint cavity. And again, these guys are um, either immovable or immobile to slightly movable, okay? So we have two types of cartilaginous joints and we have synchondroses and symphyses. So we've seen a symphysis or symphysis before, but we haven't really seen a synchondroses joint. And the synchondroses, the difference between the two is the type of cartilage that is bound, binding the two uh, pieces of bone together. So in a synchondrosis, we have hyaline cartilage, which is gonna bind it. And in a symphysis, we have fibrocartilage, okay? So let's look at these guys and look at the difference, okay? So synchondrosis, hyaline cartilage is what is going to um, unite the bones. These guys are immobile, so they're not movable, so they're considered synarthrotic, okay? Now examples of this is the epiphyseal plate. So we looked at those growth plates and how our long bones grow. And we said that there is a you know, row of hyaline cartilage left between the diaphysis and the epiphysis. And that's how we're able to elongate that bone, okay? So while we are doing that, while we're growing our bone, we have these epiphyseal plates, which are considered synchondroses, um, and or you know synchondrotic joints okay so yes it's a joint but you know again we only have it during our childhood while we're growing so another example would be between the first rib and the manubrium okay so our costal cartilages we know are made of hyaline cartilage and they're going to be attaching to that manubrium okay 
And so only the first rib is considered immovable. Okay, all the other ribs are considered movable. So this is the only one that's considered a synchondrotic joint. Okay, so the rest of them, and we'll talk a little bit about it when we cover synovial joints, but they're considered um, synovial joints. Okay. So the other kind is going to be a symphysis. So symphyses are united by fibrocartilage instead of hyaline cartilage. So fibrocartilage is really good at resisting tension and compression. So these guys are considered slightly movable, um, but they provide a lot of strength with a little bit of flexibility. So these guys are considered amphiarthrotic joints. Okay, so they're slightly movable. And this is our intervertebral discs and our pubic symphysis. So we've already talked about the pubic symphysis a little bit, but again, the intervertebral disc also um, counts as well. So the specification of the intervertebral disc is that the bone still has an end plate of hyaline cartilage. Okay. But in between that is fibrocartilage. So even though the bones have the hyaline cartilage on there, they're united by the fibrocartilage, which makes them a symphysis uh, instead of our synchondrotic or synchondrosis. Okay. So last but not least, and our biggest uh, class of joints that we think of are synovial joints, right? So these guys are the most movable types of joints um, and they're all considered diarthrotic because they are freely movable. They also all contain a fluid filled joint cavity. Okay, so none of the other ones we've talked about so far have a fluid filled cavity. Okay, so it's usually just, so it's bone connected with fibrous connective tissue or cartilage. But now we have a cavity separating those bones. And all of the synovial joints, almost all of them, are in the appendicular skeleton, right? So in our limbs. So let's go through just what the general structure of a synovial joint is. So they're going to have articular cartilage. Okay? So at the ends of the long bones, they're going to have hyaline cartilage. There's going to be a joint cavity. So this is a potential space that holds fluid. And then there's going to be fluid, right? So synovial fluid. It's a very viscous fluid, which means it has a lot of protein in it. And it has a consistency very similar to egg white, okay? raw egg white. So it's sticky, okay? Um, we also have a capsule. So because we have a joint cavity, we have a joint capsule. So that holds the fluid um, and helps stabilize the joint, okay? And also to help stabilize the joint, we're gonna have reinforcing ligaments. And those ligaments can either be inside the joint cavity or outside the joint cavity. The majority of the time they're outside the joint cavity, but in certain joints we do see some um, ligaments inside or what's called intracapsular ligaments, but the majority of them are going to be extracapsular or outside. So let's go through some of these synovial joint structures in more detail. So that articular capsule is going to be what houses the joint fluid or the synovial fluid. So let's talk about that and what is special about it. So it has actually two layers. So it has an outer fibrous layer and an inner synovial membrane. Okay, so we've seen synovial membranes before, um, but the fibrous outer layer is what gives the joint strength, okay? So it's a dense, irregular connective tissue. And what did we say was very special about dense, irregular connective tissue? It has to do with the fiber direction, right? So those collagen fibers are going in every different direction. So it can withstand forces in all different directions, similar to our dermis in our skin.
right? So that's what gives the joint some strength, okay? And then the synovial membrane is just a loose connective tissue that lines the entire joint capsule and covers all of the surface areas. Okay, so even though um, the ends of the bones are covered with hyaline cartilage, we have this synovial membrane covering that hyaline cartilage as well. Okay, so it's gonna cover all the joint surfaces. And a big job of it is to make the synovial fluid. So the cells, the fibroblasts in that connective tissue are also gonna be creating the synovial fluid, okay? So let's look a little closer at the synovial fluid and why is it important, okay? We said it kind of has this weird raw egg white consistency, so it's kind of sticky. And that's uh, because of these glycoprotein molecules, okay, which are um, created by those fibroblasts, I said. So the fibroblasts are gonna be contributing to the synovial fluid by creating these proteins, okay? Now the actual synovial fluid is a filtrate of the blood. So the, the fluid part of it comes from the capsule, capillaries in the synovial membrane. And we'll see a picture. These joints are very well vascularized and they have a lot of nerves too coming to the joints. So those capillaries, those small blood vessels in that synovial membrane is going to be what is creating the uh, the synovial fluid. So essentially it's similar to plasma, right, in the blood, and it's a filtrate. So it just comes out of the blood and into the uh, joint cavity. And then those fibroblasts are going to be creating the proteins that are going to go into the fluid as well. Okay, so why is this important? Well, it has to do with the health of the joint. So what did we say about cartilage? Cartilage sucks at healing, right? So it's really good at taking compressive forces. But what happens is, is it's really bad at healing. And that means it kind of sucks at getting nutrients as well. So it has no blood supply. But what it does have is a joint cavity with joint fluid in it, with synovial fluid. And the synovial fluid has a ton of nutrients in it because it's a filtrate of the blood, it's got these great proteins. And so what happens is, is um, a function called leaping lubrication happens when you move. So when you move a joint, you're moving that synovial fluid around the joint. And the pressure in that joint actually squeezes the synovial fluid in and out of that hyaline cartilage. So it kind of, think of it like a sponge or something like that, right? You're going to squish the fluid in and you're going to squish the fluid out. So that fluid is going to be able to bring in nutrients to those cartilage cells, to those chondrocytes. Okay, so that's a way of keeping your joint healthy and keeping that cartilage healthy. Very important function of synovial fluid as well as providing lubrication, right? So it's this kind of sticky, slimy fluid that's going to help decrease friction within the joint as well. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So we said that these joints are gonna be under a lot of stress, right? Especially certain joints like our knees and our hips, a lot of our lower limb joints, right? Are taking a lot of compressive forces. So we have a lot of reinforcing ligaments. So they can be part of that uh, fibrous layer of the joint capsule. So if they're outside the joint capsule, they can actually be part of that fibrous layer of the capsule. And those are those extra capsular ligaments. And then there's ones that may be inside. So especially when we're talking about our knee, our knee joint has these extra um, ligaments inside the joint capsule to help stabilize the joint. And those are intracapsular ligaments. So we said that there's great blood supply and innervation to these joints. So I have a great picture here that really shows you um, the blood vessels coming in and supplying that synovial membrane. 
uh, with cat with capillaries and nerves so the thing about the sensory nerves that live in the joint, sometimes they're able to detect pain, but what they're really doing is they're um, more like uh, barometers. They're going to um, sense the stretch of the capsule, okay? So they can feel, uh, it allows your consciousness to understand how much you're bending and stretching that joint, okay? So that's really their whole goal is to um, monitor the stretch and the bending in the joint so that you don't overbend or overstretch the joint. And the blood supply is super important because that's what's going to be producing uh, that synovial fluid, right? So we have lots of capillaries in that synovial membrane that's going to create that filtrate um, for synovial fluid. So how do synovial joints function? So we said that um, they're under a lot of stress, right? So they're subject to a lot of friction and compressive forces. So we call them lubricating devices. So essentially there's going to be uh, structures that are going to help them compensate for all this friction and compressive forces, okay? because friction is really bad for the joint, because again, we said that cartilage is really bad at healing. So we don't wanna damage our cartilage ever. So if we add too much friction or we overheat the joint, it's going to destroy that cartilage tissue and that could definitely lead to arthritis. Or if you damage or injure that joint somehow, that also will lead to arthritis. So we said that that weeping lubrication is really important and that's part of this lubricating device is that that synovial fluid is going to um, be squished in and out of the hyaline cartilage. And again, it also allows that cartilage to um, kind of ride on a slippery film, right? That egg uh, white consistency is gonna be really slick and so that allows that cartilage to slide very easily across each other instead of getting stuck and adding to the friction. So it's going to decrease friction. Okay, so the whole point of the joint and the synovial joints are going to be decreasing friction and uh, compensating for these um, outside forces. So there are some synovial joints that need some extra help with um, trying to compensate for a lot of these forces and friction. And uh, some synovial joints have what are called articular discs. Okay, and what are these discs? So they are um, little discs of fibrocartilage and essentially it increases the surface area to distribute all that compressive force. So this is gonna be found in joints that have um, different shapes of bones coming together, okay? So those articulating bones are not gonna fit quite perfectly. So an example is the knee. So we have these great rounded condyles of the femur that are coming down, but then they're gonna articulate with this very flat surface of the head of the tibia, right? So it's very flat. So a very round surface coming together with a flat surface, you're going to want a little bit of a cup to compensate uh, for those very round condyles. And that is what those articular discs are doing. And in the knee, they're called um, menisci or a singular meniscus. Okay, so a lot of people have heard of meniscus, um, menisci, because you hear all the time, you know, some, uh, professional athlete tore this meniscus, right? So very common, uh, very common in injuries, and so are some of these ligaments. So we'll talk about that. But essentially these articular discs are gonna help increase that surface area of contact between the two joints, okay? Between the two bone surfaces. So the knee is the best example, but we do find a articular disc in the temporomandibular joint as well. That's your jaw. 
So there's two more structures that are going to help decrease friction in those synovial joints. And they are not synovial joints themselves, but they um, are closed bags of lubricant or that synovial fluid. And essentially they're in places to kind of take up maybe space in the joint between a bone and another bone or a tendon. And they're gonna wrap themselves around a tendon as well when it moves across the joint. So a bursa, think of it kind of like a water balloon. It's gonna be this flattened fibrous sac uh, full of fluid and it's lined by a synovial membrane. So very similar to a joint capsule or an articular capsule. And it's gonna be stuck maybe in places where there is some space that needs to be taken up. So this is an example of a bursa in the shoulder. So it looks like a little um, flattened water balloon. So it's gonna be in between that acromium of the scapula and the head of the humerus. So that may have been just a place that you know, take up some space to help stabilize that joint. And a tendon sheath is very similar to a bursa. It's essentially just an elongated bursa and it wraps itself around the tendon, um, kind of like insulation. But what it does is it helps with the movement of the tendon across the joint. So it decreases the friction when that tendon, which is attached to the muscle, moves across that joint. So now we're gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about the types of movements that these synovial joints allow us to make. And we have three basic movement types. And the first is gliding. So gliding is gonna happen between one bone moving across another bone. So an example would be the carpus. The other type is gonna be angular movement. So this is when you're going to change angles between the two bones. So you're either gonna increase the angle, which would be extension, or decrease the angle, which will be flexion. And last, we have rotational movement. And this is going to be the, the joint rotating around the bone's long axis. Okay, so let's go through these individually. So gliding movement is going to be that bones just gliding or sliding across each other. So we find this in the carpus and the tarsus. So you have all those little carpal and tarsal bones that are just gonna be sliding across each other. Where we also find it is in the vertebral column. So between each of those individual vertebrae, we said that there were these articular processes that created joints between the two vertebrae. And those are going to just glide across each other, allowing the movement in our vertebral column. You know, our bending and, and side to side motion that happens within our vertebral column. Now that two types of angular movements, we have flexion and extension, which is that decreasing or increasing the angle. Flexion, you're gonna be decreasing the angle between the two bones. Extension, you're gonna be increasing the angle between the bones, okay? And there's some examples down here in the picture. And then the other type of angular movement is abduction and adduction. Okay, so how I like to remember the difference between these two is abduction, you're being abducted away from the body, okay, by maybe aliens. Adduction, you're gonna be adding back to the body. Okay, so abduction and adduction. The example on the right there of your arm going away from your body and coming back or adding to your body. And last but not least is circumduction. So circumduction is not rotation. You're actually drawing a circle in the air with your arm, okay? So that's circumduction, or with your leg, you can do it as well. So circumduction um, is drawing that circle. Now rotational movement is gonna be the movement around the bone's long axis. So we see this between C1 and C2 in the neck, 
right? So we saw that that axis or C2 has the dens, which is that little protrusion that sits on the atlas and allows for us to rotate our head, you know, left and right, right? As if you're saying no. We also find this in the hip and the shoulder joint. And if you rotate it medially or towards the midline, that's medial rotation. If you rotate it outward or away, then that's lateral rotation, okay? So there's also some special movements that we find um, in the body as well that have their own names because they may be a combination of some of these other movements. So we have inversion and eversion, which is just turning the sole of your foot inward and outward. Supination, which is rotating your forearm um, up and down, or, and then your palm either face down or face up. So supination is bringing your forearm laterally and your palm facing up. Pronation is rotating medially and palm facing down. So we can see these movements um, in the next picture. So inversion, you're bringing the sole of your foot medially or inward, and then eversion, you're turning that sole of your foot laterally or outward. And then pronation, you're rotating your forearm medially so that the palm faces down or posteriorly. Again, you're talking about anatomical position, right, all the time. Supination, you're rotating that forearm laterally so the palm faces anteriorly. What I kind of like to think about uh, how to remind myself is supination, you're going to have to have your palm up to catch the soup or hold your soup, okay? If you like that way to remember it. So now we can go through some of these other special movements as well, and you can find a lot of the basic movements um, on Visible Body too. and I highly recommend um, maybe Googling the movements of all of these to kind of get a better idea of the movements in action instead of just the pictures. So we have elevation and depression protraction and retraction. So there, the example here is with the mandible, but I actually like it better with the scapula, with your shoulders. So if you elevate your shoulders, right, you're lifting your scapula up. If you depress them, you're moving them downwards, right? Shrugging your shoulders versus pressing your shoulders down protraction and retraction. So protraction, you're moving anteriorly. So as if you're bringing your shoulders together in the front or maybe like punching something, okay? Retraction is like you're squaring your shoulders and bringing those shoulder blades together. So that would be moving in a posterior direction. And then we have those examples of supination, pronation, inversion and eversion but we also have some other special um, movements as well. So just in our hands, the opposition just means pressing each finger against the thumb, okay? So a lot of animals can't do that, right? So we have that special thumb movement. And then in our ankle, we have what's called dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. So instead of saying, you know, the ankle is flexing, but the toes are extending, you're going to say dorsiflexion. So the toes are coming upward and pointing upward towards the sky. Whereas plantar flexion, you're pointing your toes toward the ground, okay? So again, instead of saying multiple movements in the ankles and toes, we just give it one uh, name. So now that we know all of the movements um, that the synovial joints allow us to make, we can now classify all these synovial joints by their shape. So first we're going to talk about the plane joint. And these uh, pictures are all from your textbook, so you can look them up. So the plane joint is going to be the sliding or the gliding movement of two flat articular surfaces. So we see that in the tarsus and the carpus um, and in the vertebrae. 
right? So that's that gliding motion. So we call these types of joints that are doing that gliding motion plane joints, okay? Now our second type is called a hinge joint. So these guys allow us to flex and extend. So a good example would be the elbow joint, right? So if you flex it, you're bringing your forearm up. If you extend it, you're bringing it down, okay? Another one would be an ankle, right? That ankle is a hinge joint, as well as your interphalangeal joints. So not your big knuckles, but in between all your phalanges. So you have two interphalangeal, interphalangeal joints in each finger, except your thumb, you only have one, right? So those guys are doing flexion and extension. So they're a hinge joint. Now pivot joints do, do the rotational movement. So some examples of this, we already talked about our atlantoaxial joint between the atlas and the axis uh, between C1 and C2 in the neck, right? So you have rotational movement. But another big one that's really important is the proximal radial ulnar joint. So we said that the head of the radius articulates with the ulna, and essentially that head of the radius is super round, okay? So it can rotate around in a circle here, and that's how we get the movement of pronation and supination, okay? So that's that rotational movement in the elbow. So now we also have what's called a condylar joint or an ellipsoid joint. I like condylar better, okay? So these guys have kind of a rounded surface and they can actually do two motions. So they have two angular motions, so they can do the flexion and extension, but also abduction and adduction. So the example here is that big knuckle, and that's called your metacarpophalangeal joint. So between the metacarpal bone and the first proximal phalange. And so if you do that, so if you stick your finger up in the air, I can flex and extend it backwards and forwards, but I can also waggle it side by side, side to side, and that's abduction and adduction. So I can do two different movements, right? Whereas if you isolate that joint and you just look at your, the rest of your finger, I can only flex and extend it. I cannot do abduction and adduction with those interphalangeal joints. This is the same with your wrist. Right, so between the radius and the carpal bones, I can flex and extend, but I can also go left to right or abduction and adduction. Okay, so these guys are condylar joints. Okay, and condyle, like I said, you'll see the word condyle again, and that's just a rounded structure. So we see condyles at the ends of some of these long bones, okay? Now, a very specific joint is the saddle joint. And uh, the only real example of this is the carpo-metacarpal joint of the thumb, okay? So this is the, um, your big knuckle on your thumb, okay? We still have the same movements as we do in those metacarpophalangeal joints, but the, the shape of the joint is just a little bit different. So instead of condylar, it looks more like a saddle. Okay, so if you see the shape of the little image here in the drawing, you can kind of tell it's a little bit different. So you're still doing that abduction and adduction and flexion and extension. Okay. So last but not least is the ball and socket joint. So these guys can do just about every motion, okay? So they're able to do all the synovial joint movements, 
okay, which is called multi-axial movement. Again, I'm not going to ask you specifically the you know, uniaxial, biaxial, but I want you to know, be familiar with the types of movements these joint types of joints can do, okay? So our only two ball and socket joints are our shoulder and our hip. Okay, so you have a spherical head within a socket or a cup, right? So they're able to flex and extend, abduct and adduct, but they can also do rotation and circumduction, right? So they can do everything. And that's why they're so highly mobile, okay? So now let's talk a little bit about the stability of synovial joints. Now that we know all the movements they can do, you know, why can't each joint do all the movements? What's keeping them from doing those different movements? And how do we help stabilize that joint as they're doing these movements to keep from injuring those joints? So I want you to know these three things that help to stabilize synovial joints. And the first is going to be articular surfaces. Now in all three of these types of things, you know, some are gonna be more important in certain joints than others. So the articular surface, which is the shape of the articular surface, so the ends of those long bones and how they come together. So it seldom plays a major role except in certain joints. So the hip joint is one. So it is a very, very solid ball and socket. So the head of the femur can sit very deeply inside the acetabulum. And that allows for a lot of stability of that joint, as well as the elbow. So the elbow, that trochlea sits so well within that trochlear fossa that it is like, uh, it's a true hinge you know, where the pieces fit perfectly together, right? So that is a great example of two articular surfaces coming together very well, as well as the ankle joint. So the ankle comes together very, very well, maybe not as well as the other two because we have that lateral stability from the fibula. But these guys are examples, good examples of how artic articular surfaces can play a big role in the stability of the joint. Now ligaments, usually the more ligaments a joint has, the more stable the joint is, okay? So this really helps to hold the bones together really well. It helps to prevent excessive or undesirable movements within the joint. So we have lots of ligaments um, around the joints to try to help stabilize the joint, okay? Now, muscle tone is something a lot of people forget about because we have tendons that span the joint and those tendons are gonna be attached to muscles. So when you keep muscle tension, um, it's going to keep tension on the tendon across that joint as well. So um, you know, ligaments are pretty obvious, they're bone to bone, but tendons are bone to muscle. So if you keep um, muscle tone, then you're going to keep uh, tension on that tendon across the joint. And this is really important for the shoulder joint and the knee joint. So a lot of people have heard of the rotator cuff um, in the shoulder, you know, a torn rotator cuff. Well, the rotator cuff um, is just um, a couple of muscles that are on and around the shoulder and those tendons span the shoulder joint, okay, and come together and stable, help stabilize the joint. So that's the rotator cuff, um, but they're tendons attached to muscles, okay? So now let's go through and individually talk about some of our big joints in the body and why maybe they're a little bit special or they have some special features about them. So first we're gonna talk about the shoulder joint, uh, which is the glenohumeral joint, because remember the glenoid cavity, which is the cup, and then the head of the humerus. So that's our ball and socket. 
it is the most freely movable joint in the body. Lots of movement in your shoulder, right? But the problem with having so much mobility is you lack the stability, which is why it's commonly injured. So there's a couple of things that try to help the stability of the joint. And the glenoid labrum is one, and it's a cartilaginous, fibrocartilaginous ring that tries to help fit the head of the humerus into the glenoid cavity. So if you look at the glenoid cavity, it's quite flat, and so it's not a very good cup. So the glenoid labrum tries to help expand that glenoid cavity and make it fit a little bit better. Kind of similar to an articular disc, like at least the idea of what it's trying to do. But some problems with the shoulder joint is that the articular capsule is quite thin and loose, so it's not adding to the stability of the joint. And we commonly get displaced shoulders, right? It's a very common problem because of this lack of stability. Muscle tendons try to help the joint stability, like we talked about that rotator cuff, which are those muscles and their associated tendons to try to help um, stabilize that joint. So if you actually look at this picture, um, we have a lot of tendons that are coming in and spiraling in around the joint and they're cut here, right? So they're spiraling over across the joint and those are the rotator cuff muscles and tendons which are cut. So they try to help the stability of the joint. Now let's talk a little bit about the elbow. It's very straightforward. It's a very classic hinge joint. We said those bones fit very nicely together. So we have the ulna here and the trochlea of the humerus. So these guys come in, fold in together very, very well. Uh, we do have a, quite a bit of tendons coming from those arm muscles that are going to help stabilize the joint as well but the elbow is a pretty stable joint, very classic hinge joint. Now we talked a bit about the hand joints, right? So we won't spend too much time on this, but your wrist has a couple of joints. You have the radiocarpal joint, which is your radius coming into the carpal bones, right? And that's that condylar joint, which has the two different motions. You have the intercarpal joints, right, which is within the wrist as well, and those are those plane joints that are going to be sliding or gliding across each other. And then if we continue with the hand, right, we have those metacarpophalangeal joints or those big knuckles, and they're condylar joints, so they're going to allow to do the two different movements just like the wrist right? Flexion, extension, abduction, adduction. And then those interphalangeal joints are just straight hinge joints, okay? They are not going to um, be able to do the abduction and adduction, only flexion and extension. So our other ball and socket joint, the hip joint, is a very classic ball and socket joint. And the stability really comes from good capsular ligaments as well as the acetabulum. And we said that the acetabulum is a really good deep cup um, and the head of the femur fits very well in there. So it limits the mobility. So we have less mobility than the shoulder, but we do have a lot more stability, okay? And a lot of people think that the ligament of the head of the femur um, is for stability, but it really has more to do with blood supply to the head of the femur, which is quite interesting. Now, we'll spend a little more time on the knee joint. It is the largest and most complex joint in the body. So there's a lot of things going on, and it's a very commonly injured joint as well. So it is primarily a hinge joint, but in flexion, it can rotate. So we call that a modified hinge joint. And we have those fibrocartilaginous discs, which are called menisci, which help to um, increase that surface area in the joint cavity and decrease friction. 
And we do have some really important intracapsular and extracapsular ligaments to help stabilize the joint. Um, we do have another joint because we have another bone and we have the patella across the top of the or across the anterior side of the knee. So we have this femoral patellar joint and it shares a joint cavity with the knee, but essentially it allows the patella to slide across the anterior side of the joint without creating friction across the femur. Okay. So it's like an added cushion. So now let's go through the menisci and the ligaments of the knee. So the menisci are those fibrocartilaginous discs, and we have a medial and a lateral meniscus. And then the ligaments, we have both extracapsular and intracapsular ligaments. So the extracapsular ligaments are the collateral ligaments. So you can either call them the lateral and medial collateral ligaments or the fibular or and tibial um, collateral ligaments. And how you remember that is the fibula is always lateral. So fibula has an L in there for lateral, okay? And these guys become taut when the knee is extended, okay? And then you have some important intracapsular ligaments and these are the cruciate ligaments so cruciate just means cross so they actually cross each other like an x so you have the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments and essentially their whole job is to keep the femur from sliding off the top of the tibia so we said that that tibia is so flat that we have these articular discs and now we have intracap intracapsular ligaments to try to help keep it all together, okay? So let's look at those cruciate ligaments a little more closely. So they're named by where they attach to the tibia, not the femur. So anterior cruciate ligament attaches to the anterior surface of the tibia. And then the posterior cruciate ligament attaches posteriorly on the tibia. Okay. So now the cruciate ligaments are important for preventing undesirable movement within the knee. So during the knee movement, when we're talking about the anterior cruciate ligament here, it's preventing anterior sliding or slipping of the tibia. So it's keeping that tibia from tilting farther forward, okay? And then same with the posterior cruciate ligament, it's keeping it from sliding backwards, okay? So it's trying to keep it right under the femur so that the femur doesn't slide or the tibia doesn't slide so they stay in place and the cruciate ligaments are actually taut when the knee is extended so they're when the knee is locked they're completely taut and that's what is actually um, locking quote unquote the knee when you lock it into place obviously it's not very good to lock your knee but um, that is what is happening is those ligaments are becoming quite taut and it locks the knee into place. So now let's briefly go through the ankle joint. It's also a good hinge joint and the fibula is really just there for stabilization. Okay. So we do have some medial and lateral ligaments uh, to help stabilize the medial and lateral movements. Uh, there's also that um, ligament between the tibia and fibula, uh, which helps to keep the tibia and fibula together as well. And that's that uh, tibiofibular ligament. Okay. So these are those syndesmosis joints where they're brought together by fibrous connective tissue, trying to al not allow very much movement between the tibia and fibula. Okay.
So now let's finish up this lecture with some joint disorders. So just like we were talking about that knee, uh, the knee undergoes a lot of traumatic stress, right? So joints are very prone to stress, which in turn makes them very um, uh, susceptible to injury. So friction is also bad for joints and that can just be wear and tear, right? So friction is very bad for the joint as well as obviously injury. So the other thing about joints as well is they're easily affected by inflammatory processes as well as degenerative processes. So because the cartilage is not very good at healing, it is very hard for joints to heal and it's they that means they're subject to degenerative processes such as arthritis right so now let's go through some of these common joint injuries so we can have a torn cartilage and the most common is the menisci of the knee so a torn meniscus um, less common do you find actually the articular cartilage being torn. Um, usually it's the fibrocartilage of those articular discs. Another common injury is a sprain. So these are ligaments of the joint that are either stretched or torn. So commonly you hear of a torn ACL in the knee as well as the torn meniscus, right? So very common injury in the knee, especially um, the medial aspect of the knee. So if you look at our picture here, you know, usually the blunt force trauma is going to come from the lateral aspect of the knee, which then causes tearing of the medial aspect of the knee. So medial meniscus is often torn. Um, the anterior cruciate ligament is often torn as well as the uh, medial collateral ligament. So these are common in knee injuries. Now ligaments don't heal very well. They're not that well vascularized. Um, obviously not as bad as cartilage in terms of healing, but they may require surgery uh, to put them back together if they are torn. We can also dislocate joints. Now this is fairly common in the shoulder, right? So the joint, the bone in the joint is actually forced out of alignment um, and you may or may not have torn or sprained ligaments within that um, dislocation, but uh, you can do it without doing that. But um, that is a common shoulder injury. And once you've dislocated your shoulder, it becomes more and more easy uh, to dislocate it in the future. So we said that joints are fairly susceptible to inflammation as well as degenerative processes. So what are some of these um, inflammatory processes and degenerative processes? So we can see bursitis. So we can get inflammation of those bursa, those little water balloon pillows that help to decrease friction in the joint. So you can either have an injury to a joint or increase wear and tear and friction, which will cause some bursitis. And that can be quite painful as well as tendonitis. So tendonitis, a lot of people think it's inflammation in a tendon, but it's actually inflammation of a tendon sheath. So the synovial structure um, associated with that tendon. So it's just kind of that flattened bursa that's wrapped around the tendon. So that's tendonitis. Now the most common degenerative disorder is arthritis. And there are over a hundred kinds of joint damage, damaging diseases. Um, just, you know, osteoarthritis is the most common type. Um, and that's just from wear and tear, right, over time. Or if you have an injury, then that joint becomes more susceptible to osteoarthritis. Um, and what happens with arthritis is that you've 
um, just worn down or damaged the cartilage over time and then there's just bone on bone contact which causes then inflammation so you're damaging the, the joint you're damaging the cartilage and that bone is trying to lay down more bone to compensate for the friction okay it's like it wants to actually stop moving because it's causing so much damage uh, rheumatoid arthritis is a very specific type of arthritis and it's a chronic autoimmune inflammatory disease so autoimmune just means that your own body is attacking itself and causing the inflammation so <clears throat> that's a very specific type of arthritis and on the right hand side you can see a normal joint on the bottom and then an inflamed joint on the top um, and this is a from an arthroscopy so they actually can put a camera into the joint to see what's going on in there and they can actually do surgery that way as well so again um, arthritis what is happening when you get this inflammation in a joint why does it cause arthritis well essentially you know either you injure the joint or just over time wear and tear and age you're getting inflammation in that joint which causes a dysfunction in the synovial fluid and when you disrupt the synovial fluid or the uh, the synovial fluid is inflamed it's not functioning correctly and what was that really important for that was important for the health of the cartilage so essentially you need healthy synovial fluid to maintain cartilage health so once you have inflammation in there that synovial fluid can't do its job to keep that cartilage healthy and you have um, degeneration of the cartilage over time and again so your bone is then trying to lay down more bone to keep it from moving and that's where you get joint space narrowing because not only is the cartilage going away so if we look at our radiographs here here you have a nice normal joint space okay in between the head of the femur and the acetabulum whereas here in an arthritic joint you see that there's almost direct bone on bone contact and all this fluffy white stuff around the joint is all new bone trying to be laid down to keep that joint from moving essentially it's just trying to do damage control and say hey I really don't like the bone on bone contact let's try to immobilize the joint the joint and that's actually some fixes for some really bad joints are to actually um, surgically um, immobilize the joint so that sometimes happens in your back people will do that um, or you can replace the joint right so here's a hip replacement and you have an actual um, metal rod that's stuck down into the femur and you create a new head of the femur uh, that will act like a new joint okay rheumatoid arthritis right we said that's very specific so here's um, a hand on the on the left that's affected with rheumatoid arthritis and um, another hand that's not so common um, in elderly people as well so a little bit about joint development and kind of your joints through life uh, your joints really develop very early on so by week eight of fetal development so that's two months your joints are really resembling adult joints so that's pretty crazy to think about and something to also think about is while your bones are are growing uh, you have those growth plates right so you have those epiphyseal uh, plates and if you injure a joint you may also injure a growth plate as well so you have to consider that as well when you're talking about injuries to joints in young people and obviously as we get older right a lot of people develop osteoarthritis and that's just that normal wear and tear and inflammation in joints that are just going to cause degenerative processes over time
but we can obviously combat that a little bit with exercise. So why is it important to exercise to maintain joint health? Right. So there's a lot of reasons, but more specifically, as we were talking about some certain things in this lecture, we talked about that synovial fluid and why it's so important and it undergoes that weeping lubrication. So it squeezes in and out of that cartilage, maintaining a healthy cartilage, but also the stability of the joint. So if you're keeping those muscles in shape, that's going to help with the muscle tone and the tendons across the joints to help really stabilize and keep that joint from undergoing excessive stress. So here's just a table from your book. Um, I think I added one picture in the lecture, but I think this is pretty good to kind of go through all the joints of the body and you can kind of see your uh, structural classifications uh, throughout the body and kind of where they are. So here are the learning objectives for this lecture. So you can go through and create a study guide. And we do have the upcoming exam next week. So we do have an exam on these last four chapters on the skeletal system. And then uh, the following um, lecture time, we are going to be discussing muscles. So we're going to start into a new unit and do the muscles. So there's a few review questions from chapter nine if you want some added review. Again, don't worry too much about them um, and focus more on your study guides and studying the lecture material. Okay. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, we can do a little review in office hours this week. All right. Thanks a lot.